Yeah, welcome to my video blog, Questions of Doubt in Corporate Valuation. My name is Bernhard Schwetzler, and our today's question of doubt is, shall I use the effective or the nominal tax rate or the effective or the nominal tax payments for DCF valuation? So to start with, we take a look at the reasons for potential differences between the effective and the nominal tax rates. So the first reason is a progressive tax rate or a progressive tax regime. That is, the marginal tax rate, that is the tax rate that is paid on the last incremental unit of the tax base, depends on, on the tax base itself. And that is, usually it's increasing, that is a progressive regime, that is, the higher the tax base is, the higher the marginal and the higher the average tax rate is that you have to pay on your income. This is mostly relevant for personal income taxes. In most of the countries worldwide, corporate taxes are flat, and that means that they are constant to scales. That means the tax rate itself is constant, no matter how high the tax base is. Yeah? So this distinction between marginal uh, and uh, average tax rate is only important if you have to value a company uh, with unlimited liability, that is a partnership, for instance, or if you value a company with limited liabilities uh, and you take um, personal income taxes into account, yeah, which is a, a rather unusual way. So in most of the cases, DCF valuation of uh, companies with limited liabilities only concentrate on corporate taxes. So this reason is less important uh, for DCF standard valuation cases. But there is another reason that is relevant for DCF valuation cases for effective and nominal tax pay payments being different, and that is non-permanent tax savings due to allowances or tax loss carry forwards. Yeah? So the idea is that uh, in almost all tax regimes worldwide, if you have a negative tax base, that is if you have losses in your profits and loss statement, then you don't get a refund from the tax authorities, but you are allowed to carry these losses forward and net it against uh, positive tax bases and earnings in later periods. Yeah? So the rules, uh, the detailed rules for these uh, tax loss carry forwards with respect to transferability, lifetime and the like are usually, especially in Germany, quite complicated. But this may be an important um, case. For instance, if you have um, to value a firm in a turnaround situation that already has accumulated uh, a significant amount of tax loss carry forwards. And uh, yes, this is uh, important for the standard case of DCF valuation um, under taking corporate taxes into account as well. So let's look at the standard way how this is um, taken into account in the valuation. So you see here, we have a simple example. We have uh, a firm with a growth rate in earnings before taxes and uh, EBT and e EBIT of zero, cost of equity of 10. And uh, in our example, we have a nominal tax rate of 27%, which is a, a good combination proxying the German regime as a combination of uh, Gewerbeertragsteuer and Körperschaftsteuer. And our firm has accumulated in the, late, the last year um, a tax loss carry forward of 250. And now the standard procedure to take these tax loss carry forward into account is simply to calculate the tax base every year uh, by adjusting the EBT uh, by the tax loss carry forward level at the beginning of the period. Yeah? So here in the year 2019, we have an unadjusted tax base of 85 million. Here, our tax loss carry forward is 250. So you see that our tax loss carry forward can fully cover our tax base and the adjusted tax base is then zero. So we don't pay any taxes and we deduct uh, this uh, earnings figure EBT from the tax loss carry forward. So at the end of the year is 165. Then you see here in the next year, our EBT is still lower then the TLC at the beginning of the period, so we don't pay any taxes again. So again, we net this. And finally, in the year 2021, our tax loss carry forward at the beginning of the period is 80. 
our tax base is 85 unadjusted wise. So we net the two and we have an adjusted tax base of five, which is then taxed at 27%. And that yields here a 1.35 tax payment, effective tax payment. And that translates into an effective tax rate of 1.35 over 85 of 1.6. Note that the effective tax rates in preceding years, 2019 and 2020, are both equal to zero. And now the idea is that uh, here we take these tax savings directly into account uh, and discount our free cash flow to equity, which in this case is equal to the EAT, with a cost of equity of 10%, and then we get a value of 326.3. Yeah? So this is how it is usually done taking TLCs into account by directly calculating the effective tax payments and the effective tax rates. But there is another way, that is, we may sort out the tax savings that are attached to TLC and value them separately. Yeah? So in the first, the same example, in the first step, we value the firm without these tax benefits by simply taking here the unadjusted tax base, paying unadjusted taxes, and discount uh, the after-tax figure here with our cost of equity at 10%. And <clears throat> then we value separately our TLC by first calculating the annual tax savings. And the annual tax saving in every year is always the minimum over the unadjusted tax base, EBT, in this year, and the TLC at the beginning of the year times the 27% tax rate. So you see here, <clears throat> in these two years, uh, here, the minimum of the two is always uh, the unadjusted tax base of 85. So our tax savings is always 85 times 27%. That's the 22.95. And in 2019, finally, you see here the minimum over the two is 80. So our tax loss carry forward is lower than the unadjusted tax base times 27%. And that translates into a tax savings of 21.6. So if we assume the cost of equity being the appropriate discount rate for these tax savings here, then you see that our separately valued TLC has a value of 56.06. And if you combine the two, the unadjusted value and the present value of the TLC, then you see that we get the same value for the equity of the firm. So it doesn't make a difference with respect to the result on first sight. Yeah? Which of the two ways to value the TLC is then to be preferred. <clears throat> I think that the second way is the better one. The first reason is it is probably a bit more convenient to sort out uh, the TLC's tax savings and separately value it because um, these effective tax payments uh, and the effective tax rates depend on the assumption that uh, you have put into your model uh, with respect to the value drivers. Yeah? So here, um, very simple. We start out with a growth rate of 0%. Then you see that our tax loss carry forward is eaten up uh, and fully used up at the end of 2021. <clears throat> and <clears throat> it creates then um, here this final tax payment in 2021 of 1.35. So, and let's presume now that we take a different um, scenario where we changed some important value drivers. In our example here, we are more conservative and we assume a negative growth rate of 5%, minus 5% for our EBT and e EBIT. So you see, due to the lower growth or even the negative growth of our, of our tax base, now it takes until 2022 until our tax loss carry forward is finally completely used up. Yeah? And so you see that uh, here the sequence of our effective tax rates, 0, 0 in 2019 and 2020, and here 1.6% in 2021, changes in the new scenario, in the more conservative one, into 0% from 2019 to 2021, and then 23.3% in 2020. In 22, yeah. So that means that our effective tax rates and our effective tax payments become dependent on which scenario we will take into account and 
on the assumptions that we put into the model with respect to our value drivers. Yeah? So, and in that case, it seems to me more convenient um, to put these uh, growth rates in our case here separately into the separate valuation model for the TLC. The second reason why I would be in favor for the separate valuation of the TLC is it is under circum circumstances more precise. How come? Um, our approach is both of them that we have seen so far discount the tax savings implicitly uh, and the tax payments implicitly with the cost of equity. Yeah? And that means that the assumption behind that is that the risk of the tax savings and the risk of the free cash flow to equity uh, is equal to each other. And of course, the risk of the tax payments as well. Yeah? Unfortunately, that is not completely true. Why? Because uh, the tax savings are capped uh, as it is always the minimum over the unadjusted tax base and the tax loss carry forward at the beginning of the period. Yeah? And that means that the full range of potential outcomes of the free cash flow to equity or the earnings bef before taxes is not fully reflected by the range of potential outcomes in the tax payments or in the tax savings. Yeah? And that means that, of course, this uh, points into the direction that we actually have something like a, an option character due to this cap. And the second thing is that, of course, as unused TLCs are carried forward into the next year, the entire thing becomes also path dependent. Yeah? So our tax savings that are attached to the TLC have option character and they are path dependent. And of course, the same holds true for the tax payments themselves, not only for the tax savings. So our tax loss carry forwards then is, of course, used up faster in good scenarios than it is in bad scenarios. And that means that in good scenarios, uh, of course, we have um, different tax savings than in bad scenarios. And that also means that if we simply calculate uh, the tax savings attached to the base case scenario, to the middle of the road scenario, as we did so far, of course, it, this tax savings will not be um, equal to the expected tax savings if we combine the good uh, and the bad scenarios uh, after we have separately valued uh, and after we have separately calculated the tax savings to it. Yeah? So in that sense, of course, uh, that yields the result that we need an option pricing approach to capture these tax uh, savings property of, uh, of the cap here and the path dependency. Unfortunately, a simple black scolds model will not do the trick or will only do the trick uh, if the lifetime of these tax savings and the tax loss carry forward is just one period. So usually if it um, has a lifetime of more than one period, uh, in order to reflect the path dependence, we probably have to set up a binomial tree model where for each node of this tree, you have to separately calculate the value of the tax savings uh, and uh, price these uh, tax savings accordingly based on the binomial tree model. And the point that I would like to make is, it is, of course, way more easy to develop such a binomial tree model only for the separate tax savings attached to the TLC than for the entire company uh, and for the entire cash flows out of the company, as in the first approach would be the case. So finally, um, I have um, two little further recommendations for um, further reading or watching. So if you're interested in deeper knowledge uh, with respect to personal income taxes and the differentiation between average and marginal tax rates. This is a nice YouTube video for you. And as I already mentioned, the regulations in Germany, the tax regulations, how to use these tax laws carry forward uh, are quite complicated. And here you find um, a firm that has uh, written a wrapped up uh, with respect to the German regulations. So that's it for today. Thank you.